<laughs> Hello and welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Denver. Marshall Cycliff in the booth with Hall of Famer Ben Stark. And we are just about underway here in the semifinals. Matt Sperling, the number one seed coming in versus Sam Pardee. Of course, Sperling's going to be on the play because he's higher seed than anybody else. So all of his matches he will be. How big is that? Remember, Sperling's on an aggressive deck. In this matchup, it's probably pretty big. Uh, the creatures are tough to kill. That said, actually, Sam's deck is pretty good at killing creatures. Matt's deck, you know, um, sometimes you can't kill opposing big creatures that well or that efficiently. Matt's deck is much better at presenting cheap, efficient big creatures than killing them. Sam's deck has Chain of the Rocks, though, and that's about the best removal spell in Standard. I mean, for one mana, you can just kill any creature, assuming you have the conditions met of being able to produce a white and having a mountain. Right, and, and Sam's deck, that's very easy for him to do. And it looks like Sperling's decided to take a mulligan here while Sam has not. Not a huge deal. Yeah, I mean, you know, mulliganing is a disadvantage, but, you know, the big risk when you start mulliganing is that you're worried you're going to draw a bad six and a bad five. Mm -hmm. You know, if you draw a good six, it's not that big of a disadvantage. Right. So on our other match, it's a much different matchup. Uh, Valentin Mackel is playing Abzan Agro, and uh, his opponent is Andrew Brown, who's playing blue-black control. So that, that's going to play out much differently. Uh, and like I said, we'll be, po we'll be popping in on that match occasionally. Uh, but for, for now, we're going to be focusing on this one. Of course, players uh, still resolving the mulligans as, as Sperling's going down to six here. Yeah, I mean, not where Sperling wants to be. You know, there's, there's a lot of different philosophies on mulliganing. I know there are players like Martin Uzo, who I mentioned before, who mulligan very aggressively. There are players like William Jensen who, you know, are, don't mulligan nearly as often. You know, they're more willing to keep risky hands. Obviously, you know, in a perfect world, we would know which had the higher, you know, expected value, keeping or mulliganing every seven. But since it's very tough to compute, you really just have to, you know, feel it out and kind of guess what you think is going to give you the best chance to win the game. All right, we're underway here. Urborg kicks things off for Matt Sperling, passes the turn back to Sam, who's got Scryland and ships the turn back. And it looks like two drop here for Sperling. He's got at least Air of the Wilds. Yeah, which is good because if he didn't draw that Windswept Teeth, I'm not sure he would have been able to cast anything because it looks like he has an Urborg and a Plains. And obviously those are the kind of hands you can mulligan on seven, but you never think about mulliganing on six. Right. So you're just going to have to get there. And he did. And now he's still down a card, but he's going to be able to cast spells. So we're going to see a game with Matt Sperling on the play, casting a two drop, casting something on turn three, being down one card. Yeah, so let the fight begin. And it is an Air of the Wild, so it's, you got to say it's his worst two drop. It is his worst two drop for sure. Though he chooses to lead it over the other two drop, the uh, Rakshasa Death Dealer. Mm -hmm. And he does that because the Rakshasa Death Dealer is much better in the late game. I see. And he doesn't want to get it just lightning struck or something. Yeah. If a two drop is going to most likely be burned out or just die on turn three in combat, you'd rather it be the Air of the Walls that dies and the Rakshasa that you have for the late game. Now, this is an interesting scenario that we find ourselves in here if you're in Matt Sperling's seat. So he actually doesn't have another play this turn. So it's either Death Dealer or nothing. And the next turn, he's got a Siege Rhino. And then the next turn after that, he's got a Wingmate Rock, assuming he hits another land. So he'd rather just use his mana and risk the Death Dealer here, right? Yeah. Um, he's definitely going to cast the Death Dealer. The only decision for him there was whether he attacked with the Air of the Wilds or not. And he decided not to. He decided not to. If he does, um, that means... He, this is the risk by not attacking with it, is that the, the air um, can still block because it has death touch, mm -hmm. so he doesn't have to take this three-point hit and let Sam gain three. So this is why you don't attack with it. But if well, Sam... Sam's going to trade. Yeah, I mean, it's a good trade for Sam because he's going to gain three life. Sure. And the creatures are about equivalent value. Okay. But if he didn't... Uh, if he did attack with it, then um, he, get, he gets in two damage that he doesn't get in if Sam didn't have a removal. Right. But he just figures Sam's got to have something here. I and guess he, he basically just wanted to make that trade. Though I think if you knew Sam didn't have a removal, you'd probably just want to get in the two on your turn because you're on the play. It's kind of a better spot for you to be attacking first. Sure. Yeah, you give up that initiative, and sometimes you don't get it back. Here's Siege Rhino for Matt Sperling. All in all, just a better play by Matt, though, because, I mean, obviously your opponent might have a removal, and it's about even even if he doesn't. Right. So. I mean, I mean, yeah, party has, what, five or six cards in his yeah. hand and three men at that Holding point. it back, definitely the right play there. Right. Siege Rhino battles as it matches up quite nicely against these goblins. And you know what? Sperling can play the token game, too. How about Wingmate Rock token? Wingmate Rock's only going to survive for half a second as it's going to get immediately stoked. And this is what this deck does best. Um, the Abzan, Which deck? Uh, the Abzan Aggro. Uh -huh. Abzan Midrange can cast uh, Wingmate Rocks too, but they don't have as many creatures to attack and trigger it. 
And triggering a wingmate wing rocks raid on turn five is one of the most powerful things you can do in standard right now. Yeah, and I mean, look at this curve out from Sperling, too. I mean, this is on a mold of six. He goes Air of the Wilds, Death Dealer, Siege Rhino, Wingmate Rock on the play. I got to say, it's pretty impressive that Sam Pardee is even in this at all, and he's actually looking decent. Yeah, I mean, Stormbreath stopping, um, you know, both of those white creatures. Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, Sam could, uh, you know, find himself dead quickly if Matt can find a way to kill the Stormbreath. But as long as that Stormbreath is in play, Matt's in bad shape. And looking at Matt's Burling Tan, he does not have an answer for Stormbreath Dragon. He's got two good creatures for the earlier part of the game, and he can even cast both. He's got a Rakshasa Death Dealer and an Anafenza in hand. All Matt's clearly debating now is whether he wants to tap out and play both or only play one of the two so that his Rakshasa isn't vulnerable to removal. Right. Considering that Sam's already used Magma Jet and Stove, he might not have a removal, but the Rakshasa represents a threat that can actually attack into the Storm Breath because it's one of the only non-white creatures in Matt's deck. So it's taken precedent, and here's on Fenza, though, coming down, she cannot attack in the Storm Breath. Siege Rhino can't attack in the Storm Breath as long as a couple of those tokens are laying around. And the three, four flying uh, bird token also can't attack into it. So he has left the door open for Rakshasa Death Dealer to get removed with a uh, you know a lightning strike or something. But if it doesn't, that is going to be his main attacker. Now, the downside, of course, for Spurling is that Sam Pardee can buy a whole lot of time with those goblins. He can just chump block for a few turns and find you know, Chain of the Rocks or whatever. Yeah, even if he just draws lands to Monstrous that Storm Breath, it'll be big enough to uh, block the Death Dealer for now. All right, well, it looks like the, the tide has turned back in the other direction. Sam Pardee's attacking here. Oh, he's got another one. Speaking of another one, Sperling drew another Rakshasa Death Dealer. Oh, interesting. So Sperling actually gets an attack here, right? Yeah, but Sperling is considering other things. I mean, an alpha here is not unreasonable. It's not um, great, like but it's he, not he, unreasonable. He loses the rock token or the siege rhino or on offensive, kind of whatever. Yeah, well, Anafenza can put that with Swimple's one counter on the rock token. Okay. So he'd basically lose so Anafenza and have a bunch of other good attackers, yeah. which I think I like. I kind of like that too now. You're, you're talking me into it here, Ben. Yeah, we're kind of waiting on the exact life totals to really map out whether or not it's the best play. Right. But I, I think that there's definitely something to consider between turning all your guys or just turning the Rakshasa Death Dealer. Yeah, we'll get those life totals up there once we can. Little technical issue there. As long as it doesn't leave Matt dead on the backswing and he even has a blocker to drop, I'm pretty sure I like attacking with everybody here. I'm perfectly happy to throw away an Anafenza. I mean, you get to keep the counter on the uh, the rock token, mm -hmm. and you're dealing a lot of good damage because the rock token has flying, wow. and the Siege Rhino has trample. Now, if, if this is a good attack, does that mean that Sam's attack with the dragon wasn't a good attack? Not necessarily. I mean, it might not have been a good attack. It mm -hmm. depends on Sam's hand. Okay. It was certainly an aggressive attack. It, it opened the door for this attack. But that doesn't mean it was wrong, because maybe this is a game that Sam's a pretty good favorite to win. Sure. So maybe this is a good situation for Sam. Yeah, I mean, this this doesn't look too bad for Sam. He gets to eat the, the sea, or trade Siege Rhino with the token. Right. And he's taking four damage this turn, but he's at 16, he can take that. But clearly you can see this is a good attack, because the end result yeah. is Siege Rhino for three 1-1 one, one tokens, and a plus one plus one counter stays on um, yeah. the flyer, and Matt deals him four damage there. Yeah, so, exactly. So I mean, overall, a, a productive attack for sure. For sure, now the question here is, what does Sam have to help bolster this? He's caught two Storm with Dragons that are gonna do a pretty decent job, but those Death Dealers get pretty scary pretty quickly here. Yeah, I mean, Sam's hoping, I think, mostly just to hit lands to monstrous those, because if they're 7-7s, seven sevens, they're way bigger than everything else out, including the Death Dealers. Not way bigger with the Orborg out, but still bigger for now. Maybe they can get to 8-8s, eight but you, you know, you can always double walk and stuff, or, you know, finish them off with a little creature or whatever. Uh, at the moment, Sam would like to chain to the rocks them, or just be able to burn them out in, you know, potentially in combat after their pump, you know, in response to pumps or things like that. But with Sperling having, you know, two green sources and an Urborg out, mm -hmm. he's in pretty good shape to really take advantage of those Rakshasa Death Dealers. You know, I'm, I'm looking at, at Matt Sperling's list, and he's got two heroes downfall, and I think that's it. Honestly, what Sam would really like to do is just end this game quickly, like race. Like, if he could hit for eight here, and then play like a Hordling outburst to just triple so just chump walk, uh -huh. yeah, that, that would be the best case for Sam Party. Yeah, that is the downside of the Death Dealer, is that cards like Elspeth or... Um, a Horling Outburst can really buy you a lot of time against it, even if it can become an 8-8 or a 10-10, it's just very chumpable. Oh, Goblin Rabble Master, well he is getting aggressive then. 
Well, that, that doesn't really change anything because I mean the Rock Shasta is going to eat the one. It's just going to eat it anyway. Yeah, but yeah, we saw that right. clearly so, he has the Hordling outburst and he's about to cast it. Right. So now he's actually made four chump blockers, and what you said is exactly what's happening. And now we know that if Matt fizzles and Sam draws a land, Ooh. then Sam's going to win on his next turn. Matt just drew a siege right now. Four, eight, eleven. Yeah. So that gets him out of range. Even if Sam draws a land now, Matt won't be just dead. This board is really complicated. I mean. Since yes. you can't block the storm breaths, if you're spurling, um, you kind of yeah. have to attack. <laughs> Look at that shot. This is. I think he probably just thought, "Wow, this board's really complicated." Yeah, and it is, and yeah. it is. I, I mean, I, if I was Matt, you know, I would be like, "Wow, this board is really complicated as well," because it just legitimately is. But when you start reasoning it out, you can narrow down your options because you can't play defensive because you can't block the storm breaths, so mm -hmm. that's not really an option. Right. So you really know that you pretty much have to attack if you're Matt. The only question is, you know. What leaves me not dead? He knows he has one creature for post combat right now, the Siege Rhino. He knows there's one creature on the opposing side he's going to have to be able to block in the Rabble Master. Personally, I really doubt there's going to be an attack here for Matt where he leaves one of the three guys back just in, just in case or, or something like that. Um, I don't think that that could be necessary. I mean, with Matt at 13, 4, 8, 11, Sam's at 12, well, how does this one guy actually make the difference? So. Just for the Rabble Master? If Sam chump blocks, so Sam's at 12, so if Sam chump blocks the Anaphenza with a 1 1 and takes the rest, Matt goes to 13, 4, 6, 9, so he's not going to die whether he chooses to pump pump or siege rhino. And then that leaves uh, Sam with exactly what he has on board. Suppose he draws a land, it's 4, 8, 11, and then two blockers means two, 13 exactly. So Sperlin will die exactly if Sam draws a land. So if Sam just chooses to chump, because he has to block one or die, I think, uh, four, eight, ten, yeah, he has, to chump, he has to block one creature or he dies. So if Sam was to block um, the Anafenza, which is certainly a better chump block than the Death Dealer, because you're not worried about your opponent double pumping the Death Dealer, I don't think. Maybe you are, because if you stay at a three, then you can't be Siege rhino out, but I don't see why you'd be worried about that. He just drew a random card off his deck. You, you don't really know that that's a Siege rhino or anything. Though this block does... Uh, Put, put a position where Matt can cast the Siege Rhino, but that you're not just auto-dead if you don't draw the land or some other stoke or something to finish off Matt. So this block was close between Death Dealer and Anafenza. Um, my intuition says he should chump block the Anafenza here. Because it's just guaranteed? Yeah, because, I mean... Like, it's, it's so hard for Matt Sperling to do multiple things. He's got one card in hand. Yeah, 4, 8, 11. Yeah, because if Matt was to... Was that game? Was Sam three, not at 12? 3... That was 5, 6, 7, 8, oh. 9, 10, 11, 12. The Anafenza put another counter, I guess. Yes, on the it did. So it was yeah. actually 5 so that, in the air. That was really bad. Like, I don't know why he blocked the um, the Death Dealer and not the Anafenza. If he would have chumped the Anafenza, he wouldn't have died to the Siege Rhino close combat. Wow, so he, he actually just left himself fully dead to Siege Rhino. Yeah, that's a really bad block. I thought it was wrong, but I thought it was a close play. But if it leaves you just dead to a top deck Siege Rhino, and it's almost better if they don't have Siege Rhino to chump Anafenza anyway, because if they pump, pump, and deal you six, if they don't have a Siege Rhino to finish you off with next turn, that's not that big of a deal anyway. And they're dead if you draw just a land, you know, to be able to monstrous the Storm Breath, or Lightning Strike, Stoke the Flames, another Storm Breath, basically anything. Sure. They're dead to most of the cards in your deck. Right, and we saw that actually when he played against Paul Cheon. Yeah, so there's no way you can let your opponent in that spot win the game just if they just drew Siege Rhino. You can make that. You can just simply take one, 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 put it on an Anafenza instead of Death Dealer there, and then uh, if if Matt pumped twice, that would only be eleven, and Sam was at twelve, right? Yes. Five power in the air, and the uh, and then the two and from the Death from... Dealer, and then the two pumps. Yes. That's only eleven, and eleven's not twelve. Eleven is close. not twelve. That's right. And so, with the two pumps, it means that that Sperling doesn't get to play any cards. And, and then turn. Sam might be on an eighty percenter to just win the game on his turn. Right. And then if he didn't hit the 80 percenter or he's whatever, not dead. he's not dead unless Sam, unless Matt actually had had drawn a siege rhino. Right. And he, Matt had, so he would have been dead if he missed that 80 percenter. But if Matt drew a siege rhino the way he played it, he's zero percent. He's just so right. so clearly it's much better to just chump block Anafenza than it is to chump block Death Dealer. Assuming we weren't missing like a plus one plus one counter or something, and that it was exactly uh, 11 and not 12. Right. You know, I wonder if Sam might have forgotten about that counter. Yeah. The Anafenza counter. Yeah, there, I mean, I know. Right? I know. Like I, maybe I did he forget thought about he it. was going to four there. Yeah, I know. I did forget about it when uh, it we were discussing that. I mean, it was on there. Like Sperling turned the dice. Like it all happened. But 
that can get a little, yeah. you know how that is. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. In that spot, you just have to count and you know, you, yeah. you know exactly what they can have. It's not like maybe they have a card that does four, maybe they have a card that does three, maybe they have a card that does five. There's Siege Rhino that drains for three. No other cards in the deck do no, direct damage totally. to the, no, to the I, opponent. Yeah, and, and I don't want to make that. an excuse for Sam. I just, yeah. you know, he, he's a pretty high level player, and I don't think that he would leave himself that open on purpose. And uh, I think, you know, looking back, he probably did just, not see that or just miscounted. Just counted it as four because it dealt four the previous turn. Correct. Yeah. Tough loss there for Sam either way. He's going to have to gather himself and try to fight through these next two games. That can be one of the harder things to do as well. I mean, you said it earlier. We saw, you know, one of the best players in the world, Huey Jensen, he, he made an onboard mistake similar. He just he just didn't read the card. Oh, right. yeah, I mean, and that I... happens, right? But when it happens, when you're on the camera especially, and when you're in the top four now of a GP, you know, that's the time when it can really sting you and you start going through your head about, like, what are people saying or that, you know, all these kind of weird things. And and, and I think that like the, the really good players are kind of over that, yeah. you know, and I, and I think that Sam is in that camp too, where I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to let him tear him up or anything. I think he's going to say, okay, well, that sucks. Yeah. I mean, there isn't a magic player in the hall of fame who's never made like a stupid blunder. Like oh that. yeah. Totally. You know, everybody does it. I've done it. Ty's done it. You but, know, the, but the question is, how do you recover from it? Because people that aren't used to that don't have that resolve to say, all right, I've done this before. I'll probably do it again. But in the meantime, there's magic to be played where you get up there and it's your first GP top eight and you do that and you're like, oh my God, what are my friends going to say? You're thinking about things that just aren't relevant at the moment, you know? And I, I think Sam's not in that camp. In fact, I my gut says that, uh, you know, because Sam's friends, they are... <laughs> They tease each other a lot. Yeah. You know, they make each other. Have you seen that pink hat that Sam had to wear to a GP? Oh, did he lose a bat or something? Yeah. <laughs> it was, he had to wear this big pink lady's hat, you know, and I'm like, Sam, what did you do? And he's like, you know what I did. I'm like, yeah, I know. But, like, you know, so I, he, I don't think he, that that's going to be an issue for him. But he is going to have to tighten up here if he's going to beat uh, Sperling, who seems to be pretty dialed in this weekend. Oh, well, Sperling is very calm, you know, very methodical. Yes. Like I said, maybe not one of the tightest technical players of all time, but certainly not somebody who's, you know, going to get frazzled or is worried about what people are thinking. You know, he's definitely somebody just focused on what you should be focused on, really. Not the, you know, the mental aspects that we're talking about, but really just what is the best play? What is my best option? You know, that that's magic. I mean, yeah. everything else is mostly just, you know, a story. Let's take a look uh, at our other match. We've got two semifinal matches. These are the last four players left in the tournament. On the left-hand side is Andrew Brown playing blue-black control. He's the only blue-black control to do really well in the tournament here, top 80. And uh, Fonten Mackle is on Obson Agro. And there's a Bile Blight sitting in the graveyard, and I assume that Mako must have just cast a, uh, a thought seize there because he just sort of threw Andrew's hand back to him. <laughs> and he threw it back to him with not a lot left in it. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised to see this. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of the blue back control deck. I know Andrew Cuneo would uh, beg to differ. Yeah, I mean, he's not even playing it here though. Yeah, so clearly, you know, they must not think it's that great right now. All right, there's the rest of the action. So Mako takes dig through time. And then hands the uh, hands the rest back. I, I didn't see the other two spells exactly, but Andrew's got two. All right, he's got Jace's ingenuity and a hero's downfall. So he's got some action here, and it doesn't. Well, actually, I shouldn't say he doesn't. He might actually be under pressure because Mackle's uh, lands in front of creatures, so he yeah. could be behind our graphic. <laughs> Can we get a rule made against that? I, I mean, as somebody who's in the booth, I would certainly support that. It's just better for coverage. Because, like, when somebody who's relatively new to the game comes to watch coverage for the first time, it's nice to have everything sort of uniform mm -hmm. so that they can know where things are. Because little things like that can be really distracting when you're trying to learn a new game, you know? Yeah, also when 99% of players do it one way and then you play someone who does it the other way, it's kind of distracting. It is. I don't really know that much about this matchup. I think that one good thing for the blue-black control player is that uh, the the Abzan Agro deck doesn't really have a lot of burn. 
I know they can usually counter and kill creatures. Maybe they have to take a couple hits over the early game. Uh, I like the matchup playing the Jeskai Tempo deck because I could burn them out with, you know, Stoke of Flames yes. and Jeskai Charm. Since uh, the, the uh, Abzan Aggro doesn't really have any burn, just Siege Rhinos, which the uh, Blue Black Control deck certainly wants to counter anyway. Maybe it, all they have to do is stabilize. They don't have to worry, oh, I'm at nine, I'm at seven, you know, can, can they finish me off? This is just going horribly, by the way, for Valentin Mackle. He's already down a game, and while he thought he's the way to dig through time, Andrew Brown has just calmly hit land drops and played Jace's Ingenuity and has no interference whatsoever from Mackle and no pressure. Mackle's hand is all Siege Rhinos and, uh, and Wingmate Rocks. He finally hit his fourth mana there, but it could be way too late here for Mackle as this is Andrew Brown's dream scenario. Look at this, no board. <laughs> He's got a Perilous Vault and he even has Counterspell Magic up for the Dissolve in his hand. Andrew Brown, Andrew Cuneo, either, <laughs> either way, this is yeah. their dream scenario. Cuneo actually had a pretty good run at this tournament. He was playing Jeskai Control, which is another pure control deck running cards like Perilous Vault and a bunch of counter spells. He finished 30, 30th or something like that, but didn't quite make it to the top eight here. Andrew Brown did. Why don't we jump back over to our main feature match? Um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on this one, but I think it'd be best to uh, to keep up on the Matt Sperling versus Sam Pardee match. Yeah, here. I mean, it looks like Andrew Brown's going to be a huge favorite right. in this game. Right. I'm not going to call it because Mackle's hand is all spells, but why don't we jump over? There it is. And uh, so, again, we find ourselves with Matt Sperling up a game in a really, really, really close game yeah. in game one. Kind of interesting. Both um, Luis and I thought Thoughtseize was the card you clearly take out in this matchup. Because it just like hurts you and a lot of their cards are the same? Yeah, but obviously Sperling knows Abzan Agro better than me or Luis. For he, sure. And he doesn't agree. Yeah, interesting. Well, what is he going to take away here? I mean, here's Goblin Rabble Master, currently unopposed. Yeah, well, it definitely depends on your hand. Going on the assumption that Matt can't kill that Rabble Master, he needs to be able to block it next turn, so he needs to take chain. Uh, if he had a removal or something, it would be a different a different ball game. He doesn't. I, this could be a quick one. Every time we've seen somebody untap a couple of times with Rabble Master, they have kind of ran away with it. Yeah. The card just takes over the board state on its own. Oh yeah. Rabble Master is kind of like a free roll. 80% of the time, it just dies and does virtually nothing because <laughs> yeah. it trades off on another two or three mana card. Yeah. And then 20% of the time, the game is just over. <laughs> yeah, they just win. <laughs> Yeah, you can see the raw power level of Rabble Master. Like you said, it's fragile. It doesn't always survive, but this is just absurd. Yeah. He just hit for six. And, you know, now Matt would be, like, forced to cast a Siege Rhino. He doesn't even have anything to play. He has nothing, yeah. This I, is we're going to get a game three very quickly yeah. here. This is not going to be like game one. Game one was a real treat. Right. I mean, Pardee's swinging for ten here. <laughs> I mean, the only hope would be if, if Matt had, like, Drown and Sorrow in a sideboard or something, which he, he might... Yeah, he has two. Even though this is a ton. I mean, he's going to be at one. Right. So, I mean, if Sam has no burn and Matt top decks only Drown and Sorrow, the only way this game even continues. Right. And if Sam Party never has burn, which right. he just showed him. So that's it. Wow. That was a thumping. So Sam Party right back on the scoreboard here. And, uh, and we're tied up. So this one is 1-0. When we left the other match... Andrew Brown was up a game and up significantly as far as resources went in hand and, and, and answers and stuff. So we'll probably jump back over there. But I would expect that Andrew Brown would be able to close out from there. Though that being said, uh, we did get a look at Mackle's hand, and it was very threat dense. I mean, oh, he yeah. was going to go spell, 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 you know, just kind of forever. Um, but the problem is that blue black deck is pretty darn good at one for one in you forever. Yeah, because they've got Jason's Ingenuity and Dig Through Time. Right. So that's the game they want to play. Right. The game that they don't want to play is where two threats come down early, like, you know, a threat they can't answer early, two threats in one turn, and they can only stop one of them, and then they fall behind. Right. They even board and trade, 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 trade. That's, that's their wheelhouse right there. Speaking of, here's Andrew with a completely empty board. He's got like 10 or 11 lands four or five cards in hand and that's just about the dreamiest spot you could be in for a blue black control player now i do see his hand what was the card at the back is it, it looks a dissolve? like a dissolve yeah, yeah. it doesn't look like he has any of that powerful card drawn right so this is one way if if 
Mackle, you know, he was stumbling on mana early. Looks like he's fully drawn out of that. If he can just jam enough threats here, that could actually overwhelm Andrew at some point, but he's going to have to get kind of lucky to get that done because Perilous Vault's going to kill one, probably here. Yeah, and Andrew's got all turn. the time in the world. He's got 18 life. Yeah. He's got a Vault in play and two more Vaults in hand. Oh, he does? Yeah, so he's got plenty of time to find that dig through time or Jace's ingenuity. He just found a Thought Season at 18 life. There's no harm in that. And we can't quite see because of the graphic there, but Andrew, again, once again, is going to be able to sort of sculpt this game out. He's even got some life total to play with here where he can can let Valentin sit around. Whoop. I don't think it even matters that much which card he thought sees. Clearly, um, Mackle's got some threats in hand, and uh, Brown can deal with any of them, so he just takes one of them with the thoughts he is. Sure. It's, it, to me, it's just like card for card, it's right? Card it's, for card. it's one for ones yeah. all over the place. The Perilous Vault is very likely going to one for one as well, as Mackle's not going to be inclined to play anything else into it. Yeah, he might wait a turn or two. Yeah. I mean, he certainly could take three if he wanted to. Sure. I don't think he will, because there's no real reason to with how good his hand is. Right. If his hand was weaker and he needed more time to let it fill out, before um, you know, Valentine played more threats, then maybe you would. All right, well, this should get dissolved because there's no reason to let him choose. You get the scry, you, you protect, you don't let him see your hand. Right. So this is definitely right. Definitely dissolve that thought sees. And this scry could be really important too, because Andrew does need to find a card draw spell at some point here. Yeah, and even if, even if uh, he's just finding decent threats and answers, a land is practically a dead draw. Right. Not even practically, a land just is a dead draw it's at dead. this point. It's so just dead. scry is almost like draw forty percent of a card or so, because any land he just gets to throw right to the bottom. Right. All right. So Andrew let Valentin hit him with the with the vampire after plusing Soren and then cracked it on end step. So once again, was that a Pearl Link Ancient? That's a Pearl Link Ancient. Okay, so he also now has his finisher in hand. And Mockle, I think he just drew Elspeth. And I don't think that, that Brown actually has any counters left. No, he doesn't have counters. He does have Perilous Vault. Why didn't he play one? Uh, yeah, he probably should have played one. Or is he just is he just planning on slamming uh, well, per Pearl Lake here? He certainly is. I think he actually could have played the Pearl Lake, returned the, the uh, right. No, well, he wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, no, he was just planning on playing the Pearl Lake, so he didn't he didn't play it. Yeah, I mean, he could do that. What what you said, but yeah, he could. Yeah, but, but he also had Bile Blight. So Elspeth does hit the table, but Bile Blight to take out the tokens and Pearl Lake to finish off Elspeth here, and again, everything's just turning up Andrew Brown. Bang. Yeah, now Bioblade effectively took out Elspeth. So yes. this is better than casting Pearl, the this Pearl Assault. Is much better. Wow. And now he's got a threat that's almost impossible to get rid of. Tons of tons of lands. No trouble if he has to bounce it. Nah, he can replay it that turn. No problem. All right, why don't we head back to our main match? I've seen enough of this one. I'm going to assume that Andrew Brown's going to close out, but we will keep an eye on the official result there. But let's get back to our main match here, where we've got Matt Sperling versus Sam Pardee. And they are underway in game three. Game one was a real squeaker. These aggressive decks do not allow you much wiggle room, and, and Sam took just a little bit too much and got punished for it. In the second game, he had a Goblin Rabble Master that didn't get answered, and as we've seen all weekend, when that happens, the game ends very, very quickly. Rabble Master is such a fast clock. And here's Rakshasa Death Dealer, though, on the play for Matt Sperling. It's dead. He must have not had another play. We've seen him consistently play around that scenario, but you know, if you don't have anything else, you gotta do something, right? Yeah, and I like this so far. Both players have both kinds of mana or all three kinds of mana and no mulligans. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna see a real game here either way. I think Sperling's got a Siege Rhino for this turn. There it is. Ooh, but Hushwing Grift is gonna take, take care of that triggered ability. But I still like Siege Rhino in this particular fight. Yeah, but there's Chain of the Rocks, there's Glare of Heresy. There's possible ways that Sam can remove that Siege Rhino. Mm -hmm. So Griff gets in for two. And Glare's Glare of Heresy, as you just mentioned, Ben. So down goes the Rhino, and Sam Pardee is incrementally ahead here. And that's big, because you don't want to let Matt be able to trigger a Wingmate Rock Raid. Huge. It looks like Sperling's got a murderous cut that he can use to kill the Griff, though. I guess he's going to have to kill it at some point. How, yeah. how important is that Griff? I mean, I don't know. He could probably take two. I mean, if uh, Sam's got a Storm Breath, 
That would be, oh, but it's a, it's a bio blight. Oh, he's got a bio blight as well. Okay. okay. Yeah, he, I think he does have a murderous cut in his Sure, but if his hand was only a murderous cut, I probably yeah. wouldn't kill it just yet. But if it's a bio blight, that's a no brainer. Right. We saw in game one how powerful those storm breath dragons were for Sam Pardee. And Matt Sperling does not have many answers to them in his deck. He's got two heroes downfall. And then he's got that murderous cut out of the sideboard. I That's like running. It. I like running this rock. I don't know whether Sam has the removal in hand or not. Neither does Matt. But you, you got to make him have it. It's unlikely if he has a removal holding that rock, you're going to ever trigger its raid because he's going to be able to remove whatever other creature you play right. previous. And Matt doesn't even have another creature in hand. So I like running that rock there, not holding it in this position. Right. He gets immediately stoked, and that Hushwing Griff continues to peck away here. The, the replacement Hushwing Griff, rather. Right. Which, which also prevented the raid, though it wasn't in play yet. When, uh, when Sperling cast the rock last game. Sperling looks like he's considering whether he wants to use that murderous cut on the Griff and then play yeah. Siege Rhino. I would. At this point, there's no reason to think that Sam has a Storm Breath in his hand that he's sandbagging. Right. So you might as well get that three point drain. You're not ecstatic about murderous cutting a Hushwing Griff, but it's worth doing. It matters, right? It's still a card that's going to do damage as much as a, as much as a Storm Breath will over time anyway. Thoughtseize off the top, not a great draw for Sperling. It's pretty clear that Sam Pardee's out of gas here. Yeah, I don't like this Thoughtseize play. Uh, there's nothing that can be in Sam's hand. If he had a removal, oh, he played, he played it. it. Yeah. The only thing that could happen is maybe stokes you or strikes you in response. Right. And since uh, Sperling didn't really have anything to play, the only real benefit to that is that he can't draw two burn spells to then kill the Siege Rhino. Right. We had a really quick and really devastating play uh, against Sam Pardee there. He played Chain of the Rocks, and Matt Sperling had Back to Nature. So Siege Rhino triggers again, doesn't have so many sickness because that all happened on the opposing turn, and gets a bash for four here. This could be over pretty quickly if Sam can't find some action. Yeah. Air of the Wilds is going to add another three points of damage. There's Stoke the Flames to kill that, but Party's at six. Turns out two Siege Rhino activations and getting whacked by it a few times is going to make short work of it, and Party needs to find an answer immediately. Nope, he doesn't find it. He finds two copies of Battlefield Forge, and Matt Sperling still completely undefeated on the, on the week. On the weekend, excuse me, he does have two draws, so it's not a perfect record, but he has not lost yet a game of Magic here in Denver. It's a pretty good record. That's a pretty darn reasonable. Now, so he is going to move on to the final. Sam Pardee is going to have to settle for a, a semifinal finish here. 